My conversation is with Ben Wolf, the founder of Onero, which he sold to a major hospitality REIT pretty recently. He's also a unique stays guy on Twitter. And Ben is a student on Masterclass. He was on a previous podcast episode, which you should definitely check out. But Ben reached out a few weeks ago and said, hey, I'm raising money for a new deal. I wanna walk you through the deal, share my thesis, give you my strategy, and I want you to critique my deck, critique my pitch, give me some feedback on the structure, how I'm thinking about the deal. And I said, Ben, I really like the deal. I think it's interesting. Why don't we actually do a deal breakdown with a bunch of other people? I will give you all the feedback live and give you some honest ways to improve and also tell you what I liked, what I didn't like, what questions I had. And Ben was totally game, so we recorded this and I decided to turn it into a podcast because I think it'll be incredibly valuable if you are looking to raise capital for any real estate investment, but particularly a hospitality investment. Please enjoy my conversation today with Ben Wolf. And my lawyers just reminded me I have to do this disclaimer. We are not raising money for Ben's deal. I'm not advocating for Ben's deal. This is purely for educational purposes. And if you are looking to be inspired about someone else's project, about what someone else is building, if you think you want to do your own project that's similar, or you want to do a completely different real estate project, the advice and guidance I'm giving here is the same. But again, this is a disclaimer. This is just my opinion. It's just for educational purposes. We are not raising capital for Ben's deal. Don't ask me about investing in Ben's deal. I don't know. That's the disclaimer. You have to make sure the five points about why you like the deal are written from the investor perspective and not your perspective. Like, oh, I love the architect. The investor probably doesn't really give a shit about the architect. Why would an investor like the deal? And that's the perspective you should write. Ben, if you can hear me, I just want to say what's up. It's great to see you. You too. Yeah. Thanks. Man. Ben's in the hot seat today. I can't wait for this. Ben, it looks awesome. I saw the uh, the uh, resort looks amazing. Well, thank you. Appreciate it. Um, looking forward to getting grilled by Jake today. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be fun. Um, it's 2.30. Let's let a few more people come on. There's only a few people that could get access to this. And then I kind of opened it up to a few more people. And then um, Charles from my team is also supposed to be joining as well. And I think Charles, you just came in, so he's getting set up. But essentially what I wanted to do with Ben, Ben emailed me or texted me a couple of weeks ago. I was like, hey, I'm working on this new project. Ben's been coming to a couple of the group coaching calls. We've been talking about how we raise capital, some of the strategies we use how we underwrite deals. And Ben said, hey, why don't you take a look at the deck? I made a loom, which is what we've been talking about. Why don't you look at that and let me know how it is, what you think? So I said, okay, well, let's just do it online and with everyone. And that would be really cool. So that is the intent today. The intent is to give a critique of kind of Ben's pitch, feedback as an investor. But then what I also want to do is drill into the deal itself. And I thought what I would do from that context is Charles and I can look at it as if we were going to invest preferred equity because we invest preferred equity in other people's deals. You don't invest LP equity in other people's deals, but at the moment we invest preferred equity in other people's deals. So in addition to just giving Ben feedback on his presentation, I want to also break down the deal a little bit for everyone's benefit and uh, for Ben's benefit as well. The intention is to support Ben, build Ben up, not to tear down the deal. I think it's a really interesting deal. And um, I guess, you know, we'll put some disclaimers on here that we're not raising capital for Ben or advocating for Ben, but I hope Ben raises all the equity he's seeking and that this is a home run. 
So Charles, why don't you introduce yourself? Because some of the people on the call don't know you at all. And it'd be great if uh, you could share a little bit about your background. Ben has met you before, but a lot of the others yep. haven't. Nice seeing you, Ben, again. You too. Thanks for joining. Yeah, absolutely. Um, nice meeting everyone. I, uh, I'm Charles Palou. I'm basically head of investments for uh, Dove Hill. So obviously acquisitions, asset management, capital raising, uh, investor relations. Um, my background has been hotels my entire life. I grew up in France, um, in Nice. And then at the age of 18, I left. I lived in Switzerland for a few years. I got my bachelor's in hotel management at the hotel school in Switzerland. I did start my career in hotel operations and uh, moved to the U.S., where I ended up getting a graduate degree from Cornell University, um, specializing in real estate finance. I worked for Accor, the big, large hotel group in the UK in finance. I worked with PricewaterhouseCoopers in the hotel hospitality consulting group in the US. And a large chunk of my career, I worked for a major REIT uh, called Hersha. I actually got bought out about a few months ago from KSL. Um, and in that role, I was doing acquisitions and mostly a little bit of acquisitions, mostly asset management. And then just before joining Jake about three years ago, a little shy of three years ago, I worked also with GLL and I was overseeing, I was doing asset management for mostly foreign entities. I had a large German pension fund with a billion dollars of assets in the U S that I oversaw and also, um, had the sovereign wealth funds out of, uh, the middle East and oversaw their, um, ultra luxury hotels in the U S that's my background in a nutshell. That's awesome. Thanks Charles. So when, whenever we're talking to someone about a deal that they have, our main objective is not just to like poke hose, holes in the deal because every single deal can just be torn apart. I don't care if you're investing in treasuries or you're investing in Bitcoin. Every single deal can be torn apart. I think one of the most important things we look for are the basic fundamentals of every deal, the strategy what's different about the sponsor, what competitive edge is Ben or anyone else bringing to the table? Meaning why would I want to invest my capital with Ben versus someone else down the road? And we also look for how they answer questions specifically related to risks and challenges, because in every deal, things are going to go wrong and you want to know how the sponsor is going to perform under pressure, perform when stuff goes wrong. So that's kind of how we approach it. We don't approach it from the typical private equity firm way, but we, we do want to dig deep and make sure we understand the entirety of the deal. So with that, Ben, do you want to give, because some people might not know you and your background, I think your track record is actually really important before we get into the deal. Do you want to just share a couple minutes on you and what what you've built and what you've done? Yeah, happy to. Um, <clears throat> so I guess I'll just start with when I kind of started in hospitality real estate. So um, around 2015, I started getting into short-term rentals, uh, you know, Airbnbs when, when it was starting to get bigger. Um, I actually worked for a short-term rental management company. And then I went off on my own and built my own short-term rental management company. Uh, brew it from handful of units at the beginning of 2018 to 200 across the country by the end of 2019. Um, and then COVID hit. <clears throat> Most of my properties were urban and had a, a rude awakening and, and um, basically, you know, kind of yeah. broke even and got through it. But um, that's where I, I kind of pivoted and, and started looking for land for a landscape hotel um, and had moved to Austin. So I was looking in the hill country um, and, and found some land in Fredericksburg, which is a big driving destination out here, which became Onera Fredericksburg. Um, and that was my, it's a, it's a treehouse hotel, um, in the, the Texas Hill country. Um, that was my first development project. Uh, so learned a lot and it was, you know, peak COVID. So supply 
prices were kind of going crazy and, you know, um, labor and, and all the rest was, was a big challenge. Um, we ordered some stuff from China, which I wouldn't do again. And that was a whole, you know, nightmare. Um, but it did introduce me to some of the folks that are still on my team today, um, uh, particularly my GC who, uh, was just a consultant on that project. Um, cause his, his, uh, estimate was too high and we ended up going above his estimate. So, um, I, I've worked with him on subsequent projects and, um, he's, he's fantastic. Um, the only GC I know that comes in on time and, and under budget. Um, so he's a, a core piece of the team. Um, but yeah, that Onera Fredericksburg project did really well. We opened to initial success, um, you know, $500 plus ADRs, you know, mid to high eighties, some units in the low nineties in terms of occupancy. And we had a public, public REIT that was interested in us pretty early on. And they ended up buying out Onera Fredericksburg a year later, um, at a cap rate, which was one of the first, you know, I think the first public REIT exit in that landscape hotel glamping resort type space. Um, and you know, we did well on that. Um, actually had a small real estate fund that we had rolled Onera Fredericksburg into. And that fund, um, along with the REIT, is, is helping finance Onera Wimberley, our second location that we're opening this summer, which is a $22 million build, 28 units. Um, and we're also expanding Onera Fredericksburg from 11 to 34 keys opening next year. Um, Owasi Hill Country is the, the new project that I'm working on uh, very early. Uh, we're, we have the land under contract. It is some of the most stunning views that I've seen in Texas, period. Um, I think West Texas is the only uh, views that really, you know, rival it. And it's very conveniently located an hour from Austin, hour from San Antonio, right in the middle of the Texas Triangle. Um, and the hill country is kind of is blowing up. There is a ton of um, a ton of tourists, a ton of disposable income and very few luxury hotels, if any. Um, and, you know, Owasi Hill Country, um, the idea with with this new resort is that it's going to be focused on couples, just like Onera has always been couples getaways, but also um, catering to group travel as well. So wellness resorts, uh, you know, wellness retreats, corporate events, weddings, things like that, um, which Onera was not really built for in which there's quite a bit of demand for. Um, so that's kind of the differentiator on that front. Um, and we're vertically integrated. So we, you know, we design, build, um, we, you know, operate and manage and market the asset when it's, when it's done. Um, and I would say marketing, particularly social media marketing is one of our biggest differentiators. Um, so we, we operate about 75% of our bookings come direct, uh, at Onera and that's all driven by organic social media. And so we don't pay OTA or booking platform fees on that, uh, 75%. Um, uh, and, and we actually, our ADR is higher for those direct bookings. And I think that's largely because we're reaching an emotional, aspirational buyer. Um, so yeah, that's a big competitive advantage for us. So I don't know, I don't want to talk too long without diving in, but hopefully that gives people a good overview. Home run overview. I think one of the key takeaways for me and when I first met Ben is track record. Because if Ben came to us with this idea, we would be very hesitant to invest in something like this because institutional capital has really not validated this space at all. And in fact, I think Ben's deal was really the first deal that got an institutional stamp of approval when a publicly traded REIT came in and bought his other property. You have KSL, which is probably the top hospitality owner in the experiential space that has made investments in under canvas and some other similar properties. So there's been some validation there, but on those properties, they kind of had mass scale and they're investing really in the opco and the platform. Whereas what Ben did here was allow someone to invest in the real estate on the institutional side. And the number they paid for Ben's first deal was, you know, really unprecedented because the amount of NOI Ben was generating per key is more than, you know, for example, take the one hotel South Beach, the best performing hotel in Miami Beach. Ben's hotel does more NOI per key than that hotel. 
Okay. So it doesn't really like, it's hard for people to imagine and compute. And when you analyze the deal, if you do it on a cap rate or on a price per key, it's really hard to figure out what the value is because on Ben's deal, you're getting up to like a million dollars a key. And that's pretty heavy. The one hotel Miami beach traded for a million six a key irreplaceable beachfront real estate bought by also a REIT in 2021, I think. So, you know, we're talking about that level. And when we're talking about that level, one thing I think you really have to consider as an investor and what we consider in all of our deals is who is going to be my buyer? Who am I going to sell this deal to? Because you have to leave enough meat on the bone or enough of an opportunity or enough of a chance of a return for someone else, unless you're really selling a trophy asset and you just have a billionaire coming in that wants to own the asset. You have to think about your end buyer. We don't think about the buyer's buyer, but we at least think about one buyer down the road. So certainly right off the gate, based on Ben's basis on this deal, I'm thinking, well, okay, who's Ben selling it to or what his strategy is? And by the way, maybe Ben's strategy is not to sell it. He has investors, presumably it is, but maybe there's enough of a cash flow return that they can refinance out and not have to sell. Or maybe he can sell to a REIT because he's already done that. But having the credibility and the track record that Ben's bringing to this deal is going to open a lot more doors than if he he didn't have the track record. So let me show you what, let's just jump right into it, okay? So this is what Ben shared with me. He made a loom based on my advice and we got the advice, Charles and I, from someone else actually. And he essentially turned his pitch deck into a loom video. And the beauty of this is, you know, you can watch this at 1.2x, 1.5x, or 1x. So we're talking this is a six, seven, or five minute video. So when you're raising capital, if you can send this to an investor, get their attention, which you've already got my attention. I mean, this, you know, the architecture, the whole thing looks crazy, right? You're interested. What is going on here? And I only have to commit five or seven minutes of my time. It's a great return. And Ben needs to have this video organized. He has to have it recorded properly. But if he does it successful, then when he goes to meet the investor in person or on the phone, he doesn't have to like explain what the whole deal is and pitch the deal. He can just go right into questions, feedback, objections, challenges, you know, other strategies, other opportunities. And the investor can really spend time getting to know Ben without having to just first understand the deal because he already knows the deal. The other thing this does is it allows the investor to send it to people on his team or her people on her team, send it to friends and family, whatever it is, they can pass this thing around. But they're coming to the first meeting with a perspective that most people don't get because most people pitch in the meeting. So Charles and I are a big advocate of these little Loom videos. Typically, when I when I do a Loom, I'll kind of we look forward to I'll kind of play it a little bit. So. Ben has a lot of videos, which is really cool. But then he goes into this deal web page that he made. And this is where Ben's strategy differed a little bit from our strategy. So when we record a loom, we basically make a like a PowerPoint or a Canva, and then we click through it. And Ben is essentially doing the same thing here, where he's walking the investor through the key points of the deal. And you don't need to get into every single little nitty gritty detail because along with the loom, we often send like the full blown deal memo, or if they have questions, you can send all the other crap, but you want to get the main strategy, your competitive edge, why the deal is good, why it's interesting, why I'm the best person to do the deal, my track record, who's on my team. And of course, always, always, always the financials. And you have to talk with conviction about the financials and they have to make sense. So kind of one of the first things, and and everyone should watch this video. We're not going to watch it here, but everyone should go watch it. Um, ben, I don't know if, if you want to just pop it into the chat just so everyone can can see it if they don't have access to it. Yeah. One, of, one of the recommendations I would make to Ben is Ben created this really cool deal website. And I think it's great, but I don't think the Loom and the deal website are as effective as they could be. The videos are amazing in the loom, but Ben, I think what would be more effective is if you converted some of the key information in like a TED talk style 
and drop that into a Canva. So you don't have to kind of be like scrolling around in some of these other areas where it kind of looks like you're you're reading through a web page. I think it might be more effective to have some summary information in a standard deck versus kind of scrolling around like that. So that was the first feedback I had on the presentation just to make it better and more user-friendly. The second thing that I think is really important is to start off with a like a written ver like a, a written summary of what the deal is after you go through all the video because some people get distracted by the video some people are you know text learners some people are visual learners if you have the key facets of the deal where it's located how many keys it is those sorts of things the return metrics kind of on a slide deck page that's really 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 helpful Another thing that's important, Ben, to keep in mind, you did a great job going through like the trends, the themes that are propelling your asset class and your strategy, but there was too much words. The words are great for the website, but when you make the Canva, you can just kind of use pictures and the key highlighted themes to explain the themes and the trends that you're looking to get at. Charles, I know you watched the video. What else did you think? Because you've been through a bunch of these videos with us and we screwed them up sometimes and we've been pretty- oh, Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, what, I what we've started to do, which I really like, is also just a very, very strong closing page, uh, closing deck that basically recaps why you like the deal and why investors should like the deal, right? Like whatever it is, your top five bullet points, I think just because, right, there's going to be a lot of information. Some of the investors are going to be more or less knowledgeable about real estate, more or less knowledgeable about hospitality and just to kind of live with like the five bullet points from somebody must remember. I think that's very, it's key in works better. Yeah, it works so it's well. called why I like the deal. And we actually open with it and we close with it. And that's a really, really important point. And you have to make sure the five points about why you like the deal are written from, you know, the investor perspective and not like your perspective. Like, oh, I love the architect. Well, like the investor probably doesn't really give a shit about the architect. Like, why would an investor like the deal? And that's the perspective you should write it in. And I think we, we've started also more and more laying out very clearly what the risk are. Right, because it's a real estate deal. I think people need to remember. And again, you would be surprised how people see the deck and they're going to look at the cash on cash returns you're showing them. They're going to look that you're giving a promising or quote unquote a 20, 25 percent ROR. They think they're investing like it's a bond, right? That it's a guaranteed 25 percent return every year. And again, and you would be surprised how people don't really think of like. Hey, it's a 25% return. To you to get that much return, you've got to take as much risk as the same amount of risk. Um, and I think kind of just again laying out what the risk are is important for people to just, you know, to just think about it. Um, again, especially in the hotels, I've noticed that a lot of our newer investors have a lot of experience with real estate investments in other asset class. And simple things like seasonality, understanding that it's not a Office, more well, office is never a good example those days. It's not a multifamily deal that just writes you a check every month, right? On very predictable expense, um, expenses. It, it's just not like that. The predictability of cash flows with hotel is, is, is very, is very different from one quarter to the next, from one month to the next. And, and people have to remember it's daily leases. So again, just laying out the risk up front is, is helpful too. Makes the other thing that I think you did really well, Ben, is you established your track record, but I might even double down in the presentation. Maybe I, maybe I missed it, but if you go to, I'm going to go to your, your little website here. One of these pages, I think is the track record. Yeah. It's, it should be the second one. I tried the to second put it up one. There. Yeah. yeah. Front. So. Like, this is awesome. This speaks for itself. Because 
it gives you credit, but like, first of all, these returns are insane. Okay. So you should also say like, listen, these returns were out of the park. Like I'm not expecting to do That's every deal point. like this. Okay. Yeah. But yeah. when you talk about your rate and your occupancy and your NOI margin, you're coming at this with a lot of credibility because in the space that you're in, in, if you do bigger hotels, you can really narrow down a site. You can get, narrow down a market's performance pretty easily. But in these smaller resorts, like it's all pretty private. So you're kind of guessing or you're seeing what their rates are and, and you're putting it together. But this is great information. And I would, you know, you don't need to spend more than 20 seconds on this. But this is an awesome snapshot because it establishes you as an expert and then someone that's done it before. The other thing I would then quickly get into is this 75% direct booking. This would be called, Ben, your competitive edge. So when you talk about why you like this deal or why you should invest with me, because I know how to get 75% direct bookings. And uh, Jimmy, the guy with the little shacks in his backyard that he's running out on Airbnb does it, okay? That is a very, very unique differentiator to you. The other thing that I think you should spend like 10 seconds on is this first deal was so successful that Summit kind of like invested in our second deal with us and they're basically backing the whole thing. That's a really important thing for people to know because if your first deal was such a disaster, they wouldn't come around for deal number two. Yep. So that is uh, very important. And, and yeah, yeah we, go tried, ahead, go ahead. we tried to put that in the like the, the first little blurb on that track record page and we could try to highlight it more. But saying like, hey, we're expanding 50 keys, 35 million, but just making it more clear, I guess, that Summit is is doing that with us. Yeah, because that's, you know, public read, like maybe you bold that. I mean, yeah, it, it, it's a major thing. Um, you know, if, if KSL bought your company, you'd want to highlight that. That's like a huge win. You know, it's like when all these tech guys come out and they're like, oh, you know, Tiger invested in my company. Um, Andreessen Horowitz invested in my company. Like you're, you know, you're proud of it. I think it's the same thing because mm -hmm. that's a unique thing that you have that other people in the space don't have. So those are just some, that's just some feedback on like the general pitch. But now if it's okay, I want to get into a little bit about the deal. Let's do it. Okay. You want to go so, to the or it's the second to last one? Yeah. Well, yeah. Okay. let's talk. I mean, location, I get it. Makes a lot of sense. Texas, you lay out the drive times. We have all the information. The views look beautiful. You've already been there. You know what it's like. I, I'm, I'm there. So market, same thing. I got it. The financials. I want to spend some time on the financials. The deal returns are very large. You have a track record that is consistent with that. You have a 9% cap rate. That seems very, very reasonable. One of the things though that jumps out at me is in the video, this looks very, very expensive. And it looks very different from the previous stuff that you've done. So I would challenge, look, how confident are you in your numbers? Do you have a GMP? Where are you with your architectural plans? What are you doing differently on this project than you did on the others because of the size and scale? Or now that you're building this one with Summit, how is that relatable to what you're doing here? Is it more complicated or less complicated? How, how would you answer that? Just to be clear, you're saying expensive in terms of the cost of the project or expensive from an LP perspective, like the deal terms? No, let me clarify. It's expensive because it looks expensive. Like the, the cost of the project doesn't build, seem expensive. To build. Yeah, to yeah, build. yeah. To build. But yeah, I'm yeah, looking totally. at this and I'm like, fuck, man, this is like Amangiri or something. This is crazy. Yeah. This is wild. So I'm like, you know, how is he going to build it for now? It's 40 something keys. But like, look at this glass structure. Like, that's expensive. So I'm talking about it from that perspective. Totally. Yeah. So, I mean, look, our total budget is close to 40 million, um, 45 keys. 
we have amenities included in that as well. Um, but, you know, we're looking at close to a million a key. I mean, not quite, but the high eights, um, the, the, the P and L justifies it, right? I mean, I think the yield is, is definitely there. And one of the reasons that we've decided to go higher end, there's a couple of reasons. Um, one is that it creates a competitive moat, right? There's a bunch of people, particularly in the, in the Texas Hill country that are throwing up, you know, tent resorts or, uh, domes or, you know, uh, container homes, right? Like all these things have kind of been done. So in order to have a, you know, differentiation and get the, the max rates and, you know, virality on Instagram and all the rest, we have to keep pushing the envelope and, and be different and sustainably different. Um, so that's, that's one piece. And then the other piece is that the, the units at Onera that were, were the most expensive to build and the highest end and the most novel architecture, they have the highest occupancy. So like not only do they have the highest rate, but they also have the highest occupancy. Um, like Monarch, for example, has a, I think $675 ADR and 94% occupancy. Um, and that, and, and, you know, Live Oak Lodge, probably our second most expensive is similar ADR and I think 89% occupancy. So um, what we're seeing is that the higher end, nicer, um, more novel units are are performing better both on a rate and on an occupancy standpoint. So but how do you uh, have the confidence that you're going to be able to build it for what you're projecting, for what you say? So we're building Onera Wimberley right now, and that property is uh, 825,000 a key. Um, and we are actually coming in um, likely early on time and under budget. We just had a million in savings that we reallocated to various areas that, um, you know, could could have used it. Um, but yeah, from our initial construction budget, um, we actually had savings, which is, as you guys probably know, pretty unheard of. Um, yeah. And so, it's a great yeah. comp. Like, I actually think you should, it's somewhere in your construction analysis, you can use that as a comp and say, hey, here's what we're paying for this other one that's very similar. Mm -hmm. And here's how, why, and how we think we can build this one for that. And what would be yeah. really good if you said like, I don't know if you signed a GMP or if you have like a construction estimate, but you want to be able to speak with confidence that this is fully budgeted and priced. And in addition, I have this other comp right here that we're finishing right now. Yeah. So I, I work very closely with uh, RGC. And I'm actually making him a partner on the deal in um, uh, for the Owasi Hill Country project. That's good for people to know. Yeah, yeah, and and we we I tried to highlight that in the loom, and and we have it on the team page. Um, and yeah, I definitely think it gives people confidence. Right, there's very aligned incentives, um, and he, we we work in lockstep to create these budgets. So I mean, I I obviously derive the the debt service and the FF and E and, you know, stuff that's kind of outside of his scope. Um, but everything construction related, you know, infrastructure underground all the way, you know, vertical and, and through to finishes. Um, he is, you know, we're working together to, to budget. And the great thing about having a, a GC partner like that is that we can value engineer stuff if we need to, right? If something's coming in over, you know, what we thought it was going to be, we can tweak it. We can, you know, change means and methods, the materials that we were going to use in order to get it in, get it in line and get it in budget. Um, and that's why, you know, I really believe in this, this model and this partnership that, that we've forged um, with this local contractor that knows how to build this stuff. We've done it before. And not only with me, has he come in on time and on budget, if not under, um, that's his reputation. So he, he got introduced to me by a banker. So that'll tell you something. Nice. <laughs> Let's talk more about the financials. So I get the yeah. whole structure and the split. I also like whether you got it from me or someone else. I like the operating cash flow split. I think that's smart. I want to talk about the capital stack a little bit. So talk to me about your senior financing and your MES financing. Yeah. So we're we're in talks with banks right now. Um and and we there is some flexibility in terms of how we're going to finance. So we're talking to C-PACE lenders. We're talking to USDA lenders. I have, you know, regional and community banks that I'm close with that I've, I've done, you know, uh, 15 million senior debt on Onera Wimberley um, and a smaller amount for Onera Fredericksburg, the first deal. Um, so we're talking to those folks, but also open to something you've talked about a lot, preferred equity, um, if we find the right partner. 
um, just given the challenges of, of debt right now. Um, so there is some flexibility there, but trying to get to an equity amount of, uh, we're at like 29% is, is what we're at right now, at what we're underwriting to. Um, so figuring out how to get there with, you know, whatever it is, 50 or 60% senior, the rest of in private or, you know, senior with some C-PACE and USDA or all USDA and C-PACE or all private or preferred equity. I mean, we're, we're, we're basically seeing what's the, the best deal we can find to, to get the deal done and across the line. And I've had success with creative financing before. So um, with Onera Wimberly, we did senior debt with a, uh, a, a community bank and we got mez debt from uh summit from the REIT. um so yeah if we were doing the deal as pref we definitely wouldn't want the senior to be above like 55 or 60 percent so just mm -hmm. some feedback there yep as you're thinking about raising capital and the other thing that you know we would potentially do if we were going to invest in the deal is we have a partnership with a debt fund where basically we would come in, they would put up the debt, we would put up the pref and get you all your proceeds and kind of how we split it up behind the scenes is on us. And you're either paying one rate or you're paying two different ones, depending on how we structure it. But I think a debt fund, potentially one that's not going to try and take over your property and be a pain in the ass to work with, you know, we can help you there is, is a good option for you because Banks right now, particularly for construction, are tough. The other thing I'd want to see probably in your deck, like just a little note with some of your assumptions, you know, what are your senior financing assumptions? What, what interest rate are you assuming? What LTV or LTC are you assuming? Those things would be helpful. What's the term? It's probably going to be like a 311 or something similar. Investors kind of want to know those little things and you could put like a little note section right here to tell them what that is yep and That's you've right. proven frankly that you can if you can raise enough equity that you can under leverage the deal to construct it refinance at some crazy value if you hit your performance hurdles and that way you're just you don't have the pressure of a lot of debt whether it's predatory or not in front of you Totally. And we've, we've worked with some debt funds before, uh, one in particular. And so pretty familiar and, and comfortable with that. And the returns are high enough that we can afford it. Right. Um, and it's not going to put us underwater. Um, and we can refinance out of it when it makes sense. Like you said, hundred percent, hundred percent. Charles, anything else you want to talk about here? Or if not, I kind of want to jump into, cause I want to leave time for questions. At That's the fine. End. Go ahead. I want to jump into performance metrics. So this is a huge part of your pitch, okay? You were basically saying you're the light operating model hotel. When I look at what you're planning, I'm thinking like Amon, right? That, that's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking yeah. high service. I'm thinking people with high expectations that demand a lot of service. And I expect that that's going to be a huge objection. And you have to figure out how you're going to answer that question. And I think what I would recommend is you got to leave yourself some room for flexibility in case you need to pivot. Because the first property was less keys. You could get away with a lot more. The second property is not online yet. And you can't really point to that as what's going to happen on the third property. So some of these margins I'm concerned might get eroded away because you're going to need to have more staff or more service or people are going to expect more things. You know, yep. maybe you have answers to all these things, but just me looking at it, that would be a concern of mine. Yeah, no, we, we could definitely, and that's come up before. I mean, you, should I speak to it now? Yeah, why don't you tell people yeah. how you plan to operate it and what the staff looks at, right? Because if I'm going back, let me go back up. So if I'm like, um, all right, I need a full engineering staff. I need a full landscape team. I got to yeah. have security because people are going to have like pool parties and be jumping off this rock cliff and all this stuff, right? Like I, yep. I need 
an F&B operator. So why don't you talk about what your operating model is for this hotel and also talk about the F&B component of the operating model as well. Yeah, yeah, happy to. And and look, I, I think that we're going for a mon light in some ways, right? The and and we believe heavily in investing in one of a kind novel capex effectively, right? So amazing structures and units, um, and still operating relatively staff light, but making sure that people have a good experience and have whatever they need. And this location in in particular, we're going to have more amenities. We're going to have F and B. We're going to have you know a self serve spa where you can you know have somebody come in to give a massage or something like that, but it's self-serve, um, a gym, you know, things like that, an event space um, that Onera doesn't have. And that's largely to cater to groups um, and get more of that midweek demand, smooth out seasonality, all those things, get those really big bookings. Um, now, Onera, I mean, our, our comparable units are, you know, operating at around a 57% margin. So 47% is already a sig significantly less than that. Um, and the other piece of it is that you know, a big piece of that margin is due to how we uh, bring in direct bookings via social media, right? Mm -hmm. So like that, we don't have OTA fees. We don't have booking platform fees in the same way that a lot of um, these other hotels rely so heavily on. But uh, yeah, so anyways, that's like, you know, 12, 13, sometimes 14% basically to bottom line, because we're not discounting for direct. We're getting actually higher rates when we book direct. Um, so that helps margins quite a bit. And we're still trying to be strategic about staffing. Like, I, I don't believe in front desks. Um, I think, you know, I, I'm pretty public about that. So remote check-in, there's not going to be an on-site concierge. We have really good, you know, remote staff that that handles guest inquiries and can hop on the phone and all the rest. Um, we will provide plenty of experiences. A lot of those will be from third parties. So the staff, you know, it's not it's not our overhead. And we've had success with that at Onera Fredericksburg. Um, so, you know, that, that's a piece of it as well. Um, you mentioned security. I think that for events and things like that, we'll, we'll probably require some of that. And that may have to get paid for by the group coming in, but for our like typical couples retreats, I mean, we have the most, you know, benign, um, well-behaved, you know, romantic getaway guests that you could imagine, um, that maybe that changes at this property. Everyone's but, but so that, genteel in Texas, right? <laughs> I mean, it's a romantic getaway. It's not, you know, it's, it's Miami Beach. So it's it's a little bit different. Um, so I don't know that that's going to be such such an issue. Um, but we're trying to be strategic about our F&B offering, too. And we're going to bring in partners to help us with that. So it's not going to be, you know, open all hours of the day, full staff. Um, you know, we're probably going to close early. We may sell some food options that you can buy and cook in your room afterwards. Like we may close at eight o'clock. Um, or 7.30 even, right? And if you want to eat early, you can eat at the cafe, open for lunch, obviously brunch, um, you know, times of the day that are a little bit easier to staff lighter. Um, so so that, that comes into play. Like I said, limited service staff. So we're just trying to be really efficient and we're going to have people that live on site as well. Um, so there'll be two people at minimum that live on site um, that can respond to any sort of emergencies or things that need to get brought to a guest. And the reality is, you know, we're projecting 47% NOI margin. Onera is 57%. And we have more keys to spread these people across, right? So granted more amenities, but there's more keys. Um, and so I think there's going to be some efficiencies that we gain there. Is Onera in the same? How would you compare it, right? Because I think that's what's the great thing about it, right? It's kind of, look, I had this amazing business model. And how do you explain to people I can easily re replicate it? The part that I'm super impressed, right? And I always kind of intellectually struggle about it. Is how do you manage to have luxury ADR, right? In the seven, eight hundred dollars, but also do not very be limited with service, right? Yeah. Um, and how do you reconcile those two, right? I, I don't know. I feel like I, I would be thinking, well, your eight hundred dollar guest is going to want the concierge, is going to want to have a sandwich at 10 p.m. and so forth. Yeah. And how many rooms is Onera uh, before the expansion? So Onera's 11. So, okay. Yeah. Um, we're going to be 30. So that's, I think, Charles's question. Like with 11 yeah. guests, maybe there's just, you know, less complainers or whatever, or it's just yeah. smaller. How do you... Well, it's self-selective, right. Translate that ROI, that high ADR with the service light at quadruple the size. Yeah. So, 
um, we have a rock star offshore communications team, right? You wouldn't be able to tell they're uh, not, you know, they don't have any sort of discernible accent. They're very good at customer service. So they can field a lot of the issues and deal with a decent amount of stuff remotely. And we're faster than a lot of hotels at responding, right? Because we have 24 seven communication staff, they're on it, you know, they're pinging local staff if something needs to get done. So we actually try to separate as much as possible the guest communication and our on-site staff in terms of what they need to do. So the on-site staff isn't like having to interface with the guest a ton and like answer the phones and all the rest and deal with the issues. They just have to deal with the issues, right? And deal with the stuff that has to get done locally. So I think it's a more efficient model from that standpoint. I also think the modern traveler is changing. I don't know that, like, I think that, to stay in a one of a kind space, you know, we may not be getting, um, and I'm sure we'll get some of those guests, but we may, may not be exclusively getting the same kind of guests as Amon and some of these other places that like, you know, these people have money to burn. They don't, they don't care. They're used to just the highest levels of luxury. I think what we find at Onera, we get a lot of people that kind of splurge on staying at Onera and it's achievable, right? It's, it's 500, 600, 800 bucks a night, even a thousand bucks a night. It's not five grand a night or something like that. Right. Um, so it's still achievable as a, you know, once a year, once a cup, once every couple of year for a special occasion type thing. And they're getting this amazing, inspiring space and the, you know, uh, the, the Butler aspect, you know, and, and sort of, uh, staff kind of running around all after them isn't a, it may not be as important and b like, I don't know. I think a lot of folks today, like I almost get a little weirded out when you have staff that's like so deferential and, you know, it's, it's, it's just, a. I think that's a bit of kind of old hospitality in, in my mind. And I think those things are changing and what people care about are changing. Um, so yeah, I mean, that would be my response. I think there's also massive white space in the middle. There's like these in outdoor hospitality. I mean, you have like the auto camp and under canvas and some of these more mid tier offerings. And then you have the Amans and the post ranch ins and the multi thousands of dollar a night. There's not a whole lot that's kind of more in that middle range, you know, 500, 750, $1,000 a night. Um, and, you know, I think there's massive white space there that, that we've, you know, done well with Onera Fredericksburg and we can want to continue to go after that space. If you run a high end vacation home, some of them do, but most of them don't come with a full set of hotel staff. So I think if you can kind of explain what you're doing to be something similar to that, mm -hmm. then that's a great option for you. Okay. Um, I go to St. Bart's like every year and that island is built on vacation rentals. And Charles was actually just in St. Martin. And I actually rent my house through a hotel because I get some of the services from the hotel. But the best thing that I get is very similar to what you're doing. And maybe it's something for you to consider. And I don't know what you want to call this person. You know, sometimes it's a guy, sometimes it's a woman, but it's like a house mother, a it's not a concierge, but it's like the, the greeter, the life of the party. And this is a person that's making you reservations or coordinating or making sure you know where this is or that is, but they're always kind of around the, the hotel floating around. And maybe you have two or three of these people, but that could be a way to kind of bridge that gap where you still have a touch point, but the person is not behind a desk. You can message with them on WhatsApp or some sort of communication tool that you lay out that, you know, you're maybe leveraging your overseas talent as well. But I think that camp counselor, leader, group leader, whatever you want to call this person. I mean, um, you know, Butler's too old school hospitality, but that kind of person on property would definitely help. The other thing that I think you should consider, and maybe you have, depending on how the F and B is, but leasing out the F and B and putting some very tight parameters around your requirements. But if the place is as beautiful as you say it is, maybe there's a local operator that will lease it from you and you could basically take the entire F and B line item off of your plate. Yep. Yeah, we're exploring options on the F and B side. I mean, we're pretty early there, but we're open to leasing you know, we're open to to some sort of rev split if if we need to go that route. Um, so yeah, we're we're figuring out what the best approach is on the F and B side. 
The other thing that I think you have to consider is if you want to go after groups, you actually need salespeople to sell that. Like yep. we have at all of our hotels, I know how many, how much revenue my salespeople have booked every single month. I look at a big chart and see what their goal, their booking goal was and how much they booked. You need that person to be selling groups. Groups will not book like on your website, um, yep. especially the big groups that pay, pay a ton of money. The other thing they'll require is like a event planner, a person on property to coordinate everything and make sure the group doesn't get screwed up. And it's probably the same person as the salesperson, but that is going to be a key thing if you want to go after groups and fill in the shoulder seasons. So we do have that person budgeted. Um, I've definitely heard that feedback and, and you know, want to really go go uh, heavily into group sales. So we do have a group sales manager that we figure will also help with the coordination side, but you know, we can bring in outside event coordinators for bigger events and kind of require um, people booking to to have some additional support on that front. Um, I'm curious, what do you what do you typically pay those folks? <laughs> um, uh, so or you or you can't get into it? What I gotta be careful. Um, okay. <laughs> I will say that Okay, so let's just break down a typical like big hotel that we have. We yeah. will have a director of sales who is responsible for leading the sales team. And we will have a person that leads catering sales. We'll have a person that kind of leads group sales. Maybe we have a person that is like a coordinator, but they help out with like the smaller stuff, like little wedding blocks, you know, little small meetings, those sorts of things. Um, but these people are making, you know, depending on their level and experience, I don't know, what would you say, Charles, would be the range, like 85 to 190? Like, I mean, it, it, yeah, anywhere the from, best, I mean, is the entry highest level paid person at the hotel a, besides the general manager. First entry level is 60, probably 55, 60, and to your point, Jake, like a, other the more luxurious larger size property yeah it's the second largest spiral after a gm so i've seen dos of a hotel up to 170 a key and they're commission based too so um so we, that's just that's just the base though to be clear the 60 to 190 yes, just, or the whatever, base, just the base yeah okay got it Correct. yeah so one thing I remember a while ago, you posted like online, like, hey, I'm looking for a GM or someone and like, I'm going to pay $50,000. Yeah. To me, like, I'd be like, uh, that's crazy. Like, you're never going to find someone that's going to manage that hotel at that price level to. So someone actually, Charles's former boss, the head of Hersha, told it to me this way. When we started doing larger projects and we had to hire more experienced general managers that needed less supervision. I was starting to get a little sticker shock. And he said, you just bought a $50 million asset. Are you telling me that you're gonna have a guy that you're paying 85 grand a year or 70 grand a year running this thing for you? Like, it's a $50 million asset. It's a, it's a lot if they're managing the P&L. So depending on what their responsibilities are, um, that's key. Um, so, you, you know, you're not even going to find a manager at Starbucks making 50 grand. So, yeah, yeah no, I just, I want to comment on that. Cause I, I, you're totally right. I had like a coming, <laughs> I had a coming to Jesus moment about this. My, my chief of staff, Tom is on, on the call too. He opt in and, um, you know, we were, we were talking about it yesterday and I was like, yeah, I know that we did not underwrite high enough before for, uh, these roles and we need to jack those up considerably. And we did for Owasi Hill country. So we, we definitely plan to have much higher, um, GM and, and for Onero Wimberley, honestly, we're just going to end up paying more because we can't find somebody at the quality we need, um, to, you know, at, at, 50 or 60 or even 70 grand a year, even plus the housing. We got to right. be closer to 100 plus the housing and utilities and all the rest to get somebody really good. Um, so we're, we're, we're having come to Jesus moment on that. I mean, the thing is, I, I will say that, um, you know, we have a REIT owner now and um, they're, they're sensitive to like what we budgeted and underwrote and all the rest. So, um, and Onera Fredericksburg is only 11 keys. So yeah. it's, it's harder to afford an expensive GM. Um, but as no, we, totally, that one's totally yeah. different. 
Yeah, once once that, but for Alasi, I mean, we're we were talking about it yesterday. Um, I, I don't want to misspeak, but Tom, I think we had our sort of facilities manager and GM were both going to be in like the one twenty plus housing range. Each, yes, each, each, yeah, yeah. I don't know what a facilities manager does. Um, if that's like an engineering type, you can. More maintenance, maintenance side of things. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that may be on the high end, um, but there's a lot of work at, you know, it's an outdoor property. There's a lot of work. Yeah. You know, if, if someone ever pushes back, you can just ask them what they pay their GM at the courtyard in Fort Lauderdale Beach. And, you know, that would be a good context for them because they know um, where people are. It doesn't mean you can't find great people. Another thing I think you should heavily look into is the J1 visa program. Mm. And you could load this hotel up with a lot of um, amazing international workers. And there's some other visa programs, but that is what a lot of hotels do in the islands that don't have enough staff to support the service level they need. But these are hospitality students, hospitality professionals that are coming to leave their country to learn and live in another country. And they have to stay for six months. They need housing. You could, you know, put a couple of trailers, build a little housing park on the thing, and uh, it would be a way to really layer in some some good staff. At a, yeah, there's two two visas. Part. There's the J one, which is like eighteen months almost internship type stuff, uh, up to eighteen months. So that's good because it's pretty long. And then the other one that Jake's mentioning is more like seasonal staff, but you still can get it internationally and. And that would be for like six months, much shorter periods. But you can get, like I said, like J1s for like up to a year and a half. It's, it's pretty great. Yeah, that's a great can idea. I, can I ask a couple of questions? Um, so I'm just curious. So Onera versus Osai, are there conflicts of interest between what you have with Summit with the Onera brand versus Osai? Oasi. Sorry, um, okay. I apologize. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so they're a REIT. Um, so they actually can't be you know they don't like heavily invest in the brand itself or the um you know onera if you will they own the real estate um and so you know i'm a developer um the the summit deal was great and they've been a great partner with onera they're also you know they're not into super luxury hotels i'm you know obviously moving towards nicer a uh, higher price point per, per key, more amenities, et cetera. Um, so Owasi is is a bit of a different product in, in terms of that. But um, yeah, I mean, Summit's been great for Onera. All right, I wanna be mindful of everyone's time. I have one more comment and then I wanna turn over to a few questions. And then I think we might have a hard stop at 3.30. The other comment that I just wanna make, Ben, and you can ignore it or do whatever you want with, but one like little general thing, where is your real estate tax on, on here, on your P&L? Um, yeah, we, we definitely have it, Tom. Where, wh what line item is it lumped into? I think it's an administrative in general. Yeah, yeah, it's under administrative in general. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, management fees jumped out as a little high to me, but it could be because you're including brand type stuff and there is no brand, um, but it looks like it's around, I don't know, nine or 10% or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, that's, really, so, th so that's kind of where we blend between, you know, short-term rental kind of management versus hotel management, right? I mean, short-term rental management, you're typically in the, uh, you know, 20, 25, 30% range and hotel management is obviously way lower. Um, yeah, hotel management's three to 4%, actually probably two to 4%, I would say now. Yeah. Plus, plus with hotel management though, and, and, you know, we don't typically structure the contracts this way. They're passing on a lot of cost that we are not passing on. So we're yeah. holding a, a fair amount of cost at the overhead level that, um, we're, you know, recouping in, in the percentage fee, obviously, but we're not, you know, we're not doing an allocation for our guest communications team, our revenue management team. Like we're not doing allocations for all that stuff. It's all included. Got it. Something to think about going forward as you continue to grow. Mm -hmm. The last thing I'll say is these returns are great. 47% margin is amazing. If you told everyone you're gonna do a 35% margin and then you ended up doing a 47% margin or a 50% margin, you're building some cushion in there for yourself. The deal probably will still be a great deal, but you're at least building some room there for you to outperform. 
you're also building some room in there for you to slightly pivot based on what you learn at Onera with a bigger property coming online, because this will be under construction, that's open. You could say, hey, you know, we're doing this over there. We're going to do this here. It just gives you a little bit more breathing room. Yeah. I'll just add one comment because you're on it. Uh, if I, just for the p &L, you should really, I think because you're becoming closer to right, the setup of a hotel, you really need to follow USALE, which is the US accounting chart of accounts for hotels. That's okay. That will tell you exactly where things should go, right? So you, so you would end up avoiding the questions like Jake asked, right? So yeah. you should just reorganize your P&L to follow it. Okay. We, we can send you a P&L then if you want to see what it looks like. Or, I mean, you can just get one from Summit. But um, it's pretty standard. Everyone does it the exact same way. ADR, occupancy, revenue at the top. And then I think that would be uh, it'd be good. But you'd want to condense it anyways for a presentation like this. But just for like for your model for the back end, it would be helpful. All right. We've talked a lot. I want to... Charles, I think we actually have a meeting coming up, right? I don't... Let me... Oh, you got canceled. So you have a few more minutes. <laughs> oh, it did? Okay. Yeah. Um, I want to leave some room for questions for, for Ben or for us, if anyone has any. How would you compare the location of Oasi to the Onera properties? What are the pros? What are the cons? Yeah, the, the Oasi property has the the best views of any property I've seen in years. Um, it is more a little more remote though. So the the Onera Wimberley property is just a few minutes from Wimberley Square. Um, Onera Fredericksburg is like a mile from Main Street Fredericksburg. And this is close to Canyon Lake. It's like 25 minutes from Wimberley, uh, which is also why we feel like we need to have more amenities, an F and B package, et cetera. Um, but the views and the property itself are uh, really unbelievable. I have a question about um, projected returns and like, this is actually kind of for Ben and for Jake. Um, is it better to just lead with a very aggressive kind of like up case or do you want to, uh, so on our last project, we projected a 13 and we returned a 30. Uh, everyone was thrilled. Uh, it feels like that was a different environment. Now everyone's looking for like a minimum of 20 to 25% on ground up. Um, so do you just show them what they need to see and yeah, the, the up case? Or I don't know, I'm, I'm still more comfortable yeah. just being like, I here's a 15, I know I can hit a 15. I'm 90% sure I can hit a 15. I'm maybe 50% sure I can hit a 25. I think it does depend. I'm, I hope that this will get echoed by Jake, but I think it depends on the deal and, and what, what you're putting forward. I mean, even though I believe it's less risky because we're so differentiated, I think that some folks would look at what we're putting forward with Hawassi Hill Country as more risky, and therefore the returns need to justify that. Um, so that's been one of the reasons why I don't want to go overly conservative. Um, and Onera Fredericksburg, I mean, our returns were way higher than what we're projecting here. So I still feel like we're being reasonably conservative. I think there's room in rate. I believe there's room in occupancy as well in terms of what we projected. Um, margin, you know, f fair point from Jake. I mean, we're still well, well under where we were with Onera Fredericksburg, but um, maybe there's some some room to be more conservative there. Um, but yeah, that's been my thought process around it and where we landed. You this is an active debate with uh, Charles and I. So what we do now is we do a base case and an upside case. So we basically show two returns, like IRR, multiple, and we have, you know, underwriting, but we really show the two cases. And in that kind of analysis, we'll give the bullet point assumptions on what's different on each case. It might be rate and occupancy. It might be cap rate. It might be construction costs, like something like financing, yeah. three or four things, financing, if you don't have the financing fully confirmed, but it also depends on, on who your audience is like earning anything over a 20 is like really hard. Okay. And yeah. for some reason, all these crypto people and online investors think that it's easy so I guess if you're raising money from like $25,000 people and they want to see some crazy return, then maybe you go with your biggest thing. But I always like to leave a lot to be desired because when you have that investor calling you, it's like, hey, you're like 1% behind in your cash on cash return. Well, it's like, dude, I just gave you a 15. No, oh, you said we were going to get a 16. Well, okay. Um, I think it's just better to be more conservative and outperform. That said though, 
if you're showing a development deal or a construction deal and it has the same IRR as like a down the fairway value add multifamily deal, then it's going to be tough to raise money because the hotel deal in the Texas Hill Country is way more complicated and risky. So you have to make sure that the returns align with the level of risk. The other thing that Charles always says, and we politely remind people, is to hit a 25% IRR, you need to be taking a lot of risk. When Ben hit, like, what did you hit, Ben? Like a 70 IRR? No, but like, forget about that. The timeline was yeah. super short. But like the multiple, okay? A 4X multiple. He took a lot of risk. Like, he had a bunch of like Airbnbs in Austin and built these crazy like structures in the woods and sold it for a lot of money. That was risky. So he got paid for all that risk. But well, it, and so did know, our investors. So did our investors, right? The people 100%. that invested in me, the people that invested in me when I had no development experience, right? That were like, yeah, I mean, they exactly. they got rewarded for their risk. They took a lot of risk. Yeah. But if Ben would have gone to those investors and been like, hey, I'm going to build all this crazy stuff in the woods and I'm going to sell it to a REIT and all this stuff has to happen and you're going to get a 10% IRR. People would have been like, no, I'm not doing that. Yeah. So you got to like kind of measure the returns with the amount of risk, but also remind people that in order to hit those returns, they need to understand they're taking risk. So if something goes wrong, don't come complain to me that this thing happened because I told you what the risks are. Yeah. And, and, and I definitely echo what Jake said around different cases. Um, whenever we share, you know, versions of the model with folks, we have a, 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 a mid case base and reach or mid low and reach. Yeah. Uh, Nish. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, just a bit of a different, uh, wavelength here, but, uh, Ben, you talked a little bit about your, um, social media and how it was a big driver of direct bookings. Can you, uh, talk a little more about that. I know you uh, mentioned you're vertically integrated. So is it fully in-house? Uh, what has resonated? I see a lot of lifestyle shots as well as reels. Like how do you, how have you leveraged social media marketing? Any other insights there to drive direct bookings? Yeah. So, I mean, it's been a, a learning process. I did not come into this as a social media person or a media person in, in general at all. Um, and really like early on, we had an influencer hit us up on Airbnb, which is where we launched. We weren't doing direct at all when we first started. She wanted to come out, showcase the property, um, was persistent. So I finally said, okay. And then we spun up a direct booking site and she came out and we did like 15,000 in direct bookings on her first post. And then we did another 15, like a month later when she came back. So I got turned on to it through that experience, started kind of managing the account myself, mostly photos, um, really just based on influencers was driving the booking traffic. Uh, I think we did about 30 to 35% direct in that first full year of 2022, um, decided to double down on it because of the success and tried to hire an agency. Um, it was, it was underwhelmed, uh, to say the least, and, um, was kind of doing better, I think on my own. And so that's when we built a team in house and, <clears throat> invested heavily in it. And, and I believe today, like we're about 50, 50, a development and like operator group and a media and marketing company. Um, and that, that sort of shows through in our headcount. We're about, you know, 50, 50 in those two buckets and areas. Um, and yeah, we have, you know, shooters, editors, social media managers, you know, VAs that support, um, content groups that, that, you know, supplement some of what we're doing. Um, and it is, you know, it's definitely reels, um, certainly working with influencers that are targeted and um, have high engagement uh, to help grow the audience and, you know, having really good content, engaging reels, calling out your customer, like right up front in those reels. Couples Getaway, Fredericksburg, Texas. So like when they are scrolling and they see it, they know it's for them and they know to engage with it. Um, that's one thing that we've been working, you know, thinking about a lot lately and has been working really well. We manage for another property in Wimberley. We do third party management and we do marketing and media for uh, um, social media for for third parties as well, if they're kind of in our niche. And this little, you know, three unit glamping place, um, you know, tents effectively in Wimberley. Um, we just, you know, they have like 
thir- they had 35,000 followers. Um, we got a video to go viral has, you know, close to 3 million views. Um, they're getting tons of direct bookings and we bumped their follower account from like 35 to 50 in like three weeks, um, all through this strategy of like really high quality content, engaging emotional appeal, some lifestyle shots. So you can visualize yourself there, um, a call out up front, couples retreat, Wimberley, Texas, and then captions all throughout that keep people engaged. So, I mean, I could, I could talk forever on this. I don't want to take too much time, but um, it's, it's, it's important. We, yeah. in our lifestyle hotels, that's really the only marketing we do is social media marketing. And it's basically through influencers. We have a social media company that manages it. They manage the influencers. It's um, really important, and particularly these hotels, because they're so eye-catching. That is needs to be a huge part of your budget. Any other, <laughs> any other questions? Mike, I think, asked about Waterfall. I don't know. Mike, are you still on? I could talk about that briefly. Um, waterfall structure. You want me to um, you want launch to talk to your Waterfall, Ben? Sure. Yeah. So um, we we have um, two different splits, and I did get this from Jake. Actually, uh, we have a. Does that uh, mean I get the cash flow? <laughs> <laughs> we have we have an operating cash flow split, um, and there's still a preferred return. So there's a ten pref on both the operating cash flow and then like the deal as a whole. Um, there's also a ten percent preferred return compounding. Um, but on the the year over year, it's you know ten percent annual, and then we have a GP catch up. So um, LPs get first 10%, we get the next two and a half, right, to catch up. Um, and then it's 80, 20 from there. And then at the end of the deal, um, you know, or when we sell or refinance or whatever, um, LPs get full return of capital plus 10% uh, compounding annually over the term. Um, and, you know, deducted from that are the cash flows that they already received. Um, and, and then we do, you know, GP catch up and 60, 40 above that. Um, so on the operating, it's a 10 pref, 80, 20 on the capital event or total life of the deal. It's, uh, uh, again, a 10 pref compounding and uh, 60, 40. Pretty reasonable. I would say it's a development deal. Yeah. Ho- hopefully that, that makes sense. Um, and yeah, 2% asset management fee. We do have a dev fee in there. Um, and that that's that's pretty much it. So um, any other questions? If not, we will wrap it up. Um, I put Charles's email address in the chat. If you guys are looking to learn more about us or invest in our new GP fund, which is launching officially, I think, next week, please reach out. Um, maybe we'll invest in Ben's deal. So if you want to invest through us, you could do that. Or you can invest directly <laughs> with Ben. And Before you said that, Jake, I threw my email in. So I apologize. <laughs> Send your email out. right here. If you want to invest in Ben's deal, we're not supporting it or advocating it for it. That's that's what Ben's here for. So he's going to do all that. I'm sure he'll give you some nice days. We always love the investors that email us because their friend of a friend of a friend is passing through the hotel and wants to stay in the room and doesn't want to pay the $300 rate. So I'm sure Ben will offer those same perks to you. But um, otherwise, keep being active in the community. We'll all be successful. And I hope you guys have a great day. Thank you all. Thanks, Thanks everybody, ben. for hopping You're in. A champ. Jake, really appreciate you, uh, you doing this. Great idea. It's fun. Yeah. Thanks to Charles. Thanks, ben. See you in a few weeks. Off. Yeah, sounds good. Thanks, David. Thanks. All right. Hey, everyone. It's Jake here. Thanks again for joining me on this conversation. Be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or YouTube. Lastly, don't forget to follow me on Twitter at Jay Warzak. I'll see you in the next episode. Jake Warzak is the founder and CEO of Dove Hill Capital Management. All opinions expressed by Jake and his guests are solely their own and do not reflect the opinions of Dove Hill Capital Management. This podcast is for informational purposes only and does not reflect or represent real estate, financial, or investment advice.